Thank you for spending time in the Word with us this morning. Thanks for taking a little bit of time just to breathe and to be. There's so much going on. There's so much chaos in our world. And so to get a chance to be together but be quiet is not something that we often get to do. And we've been walking through this series, Be the Church. Now, we took a pause last week as Dr. Jack Beck was here with us to walk us through the importance of understanding the Old Testament to the story of the gospel. It was so good. If you did not get a chance to hear it, I would encourage you to go back last week online and you can watch it. But we are headed back into our series where we are talking about the mission and the vision. What is the thing that God has called us to do? We've been here for about a year and a half now. And it's time to remember that that which sent us out in the first place and to come back to what we're all about. That way, if you're new or have been with us a few months, you can decide this is something I do want to be a part of. Or, you know what? No, thanks. I'm going to look somewhere else. And that's okay. We are one of many churches who are walking out the call of the gospel, but we are going to do what God has asked us to do in this community, and we're going to do it unashamedly to the best of our ability. We're going to fumble our way through it. We are going to learn through the process, and we are going to be grateful for how God changes us through the whole thing. We've talked about vision. Vision is why we do what we do. What is the message that God has laid upon our hearts? And for us, that is refuge, transformation, and partnership. And we spent the first two weeks really processing that refuge piece. What does it mean for us to go into the cave? What does it mean for us to seek refuge, to know that we may be in debt, in distress, discontented, and that those aren't just simple words. Those are deep, soul-crushing words that just like 1 Samuel 22, David and his men flew to the caves in those same places, and it was there that they met with God of refuge. It was there that they were able to take stock of how they were really doing. And part of refuge is taking stock of how we're really doing. And it was from that place that something happened, that they were drastically changed for the gospel, and they left as one of the greatest fighting forces Israel has ever known. What happened to those men in the cave? Well, we believe it starts with that idea of recognizing we serve a God who loves us as we are, who takes us beaten up and broken. But we also believe that he loves us too much to let us stay there. He doesn't want to let us continue to stay in the sin that entangles us, the circumstances that threaten to overwhelm us, that he has life abundant for us. Not that everything is going to be perfect, but his presence is with us in the journey, and that means we can have peace and hope no matter what comes our way. That there's this internal change that happens within us. And so, because of that, this has become our ser sermon series overview, if you will. Not only are we called to carry a mission and vision as God's people, but we are also challenged to see that how we carry out the message of the gospel stems out of who we are as believers, not just what we do. We are called to be the church. In other words, this series will focus on what it means to be people of refuge, engage in the hard work of transformation, and use our gifts and talents to partner with him. And I can't help but wonder if some people read hard work of transformation and they think, I am out. <laughs> Life is hard enough. You want me to do what? I came in here so that I could just breathe and be. I don't want to have to change. I get it. I get it. And there is part of the journey where there's no rush. That we get to sit in the weeds, beaten up broken down for as long as it takes for us to see him and encounter him. But what we find is that when we allow ourselves that space, there begins to grow in us a desire for something more, something real. And I, I used this analogy last year. We were joking about it earlier because a bunch of folks saw it before service. They're like, oh, you're doing the sandwich analogy again. Last year, I used a real sandwich and I smashed it all over the stage. And I'm not going to do that this time because this is a permanent stage. Um, but I used the same picture last year. And I used, I used it originally when I used to teach this through our impact center. I would use this. So this is a sandwich. This is a toy sandwich. It is currently a vegetarian sandwich because I can't find the meat piece. Uh, but, you know, it's still thick and hearty. We'll give it that. 
But we talked about this idea that when we think about transformation, we have to take an honest look at our life. That God has designed us, if you will, for better or for worse, to be a sandwich. And all that entails a sandwich. That we are designed to be whole. We are designed to be complete. And that there are different parts of us that make up the whole. We have our emotions. The way we feel. We have our will, the things that we want to do, that we desire to do. We have our minds. Congratulations, your minds are an onion. I'm pretty sure that's what this is. But we have our minds, what we think about. We have our bodies, which encompass the bread of the sandwich. And we're designed, all of that, to be whole. We are designed to be, this is going to rhyme, I'm sorry, a soul. We don't have a soul, we are a soul, and all of the things that that encompasses. Yet here's the problem. We tend, as humans, in our humanness, in our sin sometimes, to neglect parts of who we are because other parts look shinier and feel better. If all I do is focus on my mind and learning as much as I can but neglect how I feel, before I know it, I'm not a sandwich anymore. I'm just a stinky onion. Or if I'm so focused on my body, on how I look, and if I look good enough, and if I'm fit, and I neglect my mind, if I neglect my will, and all of a sudden I'm just this empty shell of a person walking around, what we find is that this right here is not a sandwich. This right here is simply bread. That God designs his people to be whole, to be complete. To come to him broken up, broken and beaten up, and he puts us back together. He creates us back into that which we were created for, and it's then that we are whole. And yet so often we walk around with only fragmented pieces of who we are, and we wonder why we're feeling so discouraged. The heart of transformation comes in putting ourselves back together comes in recognizing that we do have a mind. God created us to think and to feel. And in fact, I would argue the same as A.W. Tozer, that how we think about God is the single most important thing about us. Because how we think about him frames how we interact with him and how we interact with others. He created us with our will, that desire, those gifts that he has given us. And as we walk through the hard work of transformation, what we find is that ultimately it's worth it. Because we can be what we were created for, to be in community with him, walking out the gifts and graces to steward this world that we live in well. And so that's why that's such a key part of who we are as a church. That's why you're going to hear us talk openly from up here about things like counseling, the need for community, the purpose of diving into the word. We believe all of that is so crucial. But I want to take us through a glimpse, through a basic idea of transformation and where it starts today. But I want to challenge us because I have been feeling led. I'm going to put down my sandwich. Um, I have been feeling led over the past couple weeks as we think about these verses, these passages of Scripture that really frame the DNA of Crossroads, as we think about the cave of refuge and what that means for us, I have been challenged that we are ready as a church to take the next step. And what I mean by that is this. Throughout the first year and a half, we have spent quite a bit of time recognizing that we are all part of this story to walk this out in this community. We've been spending a lot of time talking about what does it mean for you to lean into your gifts and graces. We've been spending a lot of time talking about the non-negotiables for us, that Jesus is the center of the story first and foremost and always. And what we have seen emerge has been really beautiful. We're hearing great stories of what God is doing in people's lives as they learn to grab a hold of this mission and vision. But I think true transformation comes not simply in being known. Here's my name. Here's what I do. Hi on a Sunday. I think true transformation comes in the hard work and willingness to lean into community. And I think we as a church are ready for some next steps in community. 
and I'll talk about what that means here in just a second. But I want to come back to what is transformation really about. So I'm going to take you through a little bit of some of the tools that we walk through in our discipleship with our discipleship groups. Now, if you're thinking, I want to get in a discipleship group, I don't know what that is. I want to say this to you. Part of what we're going to be working towards is beginning to use these tools as we build community together. So hopefully this gets you excited, but this is not the only way to walk out transformation. There are all sorts of different ways that we'll be leaning into in the days ahead. And so I want us all, if you have your Bibles out still, if you have your phone apps, we are going to look at Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, verse 9. Give you a second to get there. If you're watching with us online, please join us as well. Mark chapter 1, verse 9. It says this, At that time Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, and he was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove, and a voice from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was tempted in the desert forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels attended him. I want to read that baptism part one more time. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove, and a voice from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And what we see here is a very deep theological concept. Not only are we reminded when we read this story and others of the perfect, beautiful glimpse of the Trinity that we can't talk about the Son without the Father. We can't talk about the Father without the Spirit. And they're all there at this moment where Jesus is being baptized. But we also see this beautiful glimpse into the reality of relationship that began all the way back in the garden, but that we lost when sin entered the picture. See, God looks down at Jesus, and he says, You are my son, and whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And if we look at Jesus' life, what we find is that he has not yet even begun his public ministry. Yes, he's had encounters at the temple. We read little glimpses, but the public three-year ministry in which he raised people from the dead and which he preached to the multitudes and performed all of these miracles has not yet even started. And what do we hear the Father say to him out of the get-go before he has done anything? You are my son in whom I am well pleased. And we see this theme run all throughout Scripture. And in fact, not only do we see this theme run all throughout Scripture, we see this theme run in how the Father talks about us in scripture, that before we've done anything, we have his love. Before we have become a doctor or a pastor or a teacher or the perfect wife or husband, God loves us exactly for who we are, and he's well pleased with us. And then we see that it's out of that that Jesus then goes into the desert, has the strength to be tempted. And what do we see the devil tempting Jesus with all three times? He starts by saying, if you are the son of God. That the enemy always seeks to attack our identity first and foremost. And this glimpse, this beautiful picture is what we have come to know as the covenant identity triangle. That the father speaks identity into the son And out of that place, the Son then is able to go out into the world. And what God does with Jesus, because Jesus is God, he does with us through grace. Through the perfect gift of his love. To say, you are loved and well pleased. I created you. And guess what? I don't make mistakes. And when we learn that and understand that identity, then we are able to go out into the world But the problem is, is that, I don't know if you're like me, I get this backwards all the time. I think that if I can go the other way around the triangle, that if I could do enough, if I could be enough, then maybe I'll have value. Then maybe I'll be loved. Then maybe 
I'll be seen as significant. And I spend all of my time and all of my energy going backwards around that triangle, and I never actually get the identity that I'm seeking because I'm going about it backwards. But what we see very clearly throughout the story of our lives, the story of Scripture, is that there tend to be three voices that send us backwards around that triangle. There's the voice of the world, culture, media, politics, the whole world that has lots of thoughts and opinions about the way things should operate, and those begin to influence us. What we can see that sends us backwards around the triangle is the voice of the enemy that whispers lies into our ears. What sends us backwards around the triangle is our own voice, the patterns and the lies that we begin to tell ourselves. Nobody really likes me. I'm not nearly as good as he is at that thing. I don't even like myself, so why would God like me? And we fill it in with all of these lies, and we find ourselves stuck going backwards. So the heart of transformation lies in the recalibration, the recognizing what's happening, and tuning our ears first and foremost to the voice of the Father through Jesus. There is only one thing that sends us the right way through that relationship triangle, the covenant identity triangle. It is the voice of the Father. I love this quote. The relationship between creator and creature establishes our true identity in the beginning. The problem is that Adam and Eve didn't accept their identity. Rebelling against God and deciding that that could take his place. The relationship was broken, and we have been searching for our true identity ever since. And we have to address this tendency in ourselves. We have to recalibrate. We have to repent. And I say that word knowing that, yes, I mean what I say. Sometimes repent is legitimately saying, sorry, God, I really tried to take control here. But there's another idea of the word repent that I'm going to come to in a second. But this idea of transformation comes in stopping. Hold on. Hold on. What voice have I been listening to? How do I hear the Father's voice? How do I let that transform me? How do I hear the truth about who he is, who I am, and how he views the world? That is what gets the ball rolling in the heart of transformation. See, transformation lies in the recalibrating and the repenting from the idea that how we perceive or interact with and understand God, the world, or ourselves might be skewed and we need some help. And that he wants to change our minds about that perception, that interaction, and that understanding. And so those terms, recalibrating, repenting, to change our mind, we talk a lot about in discipleship. We talk a lot about what does it mean for us to think rightly about God. And we talk about this picture, and I'm going to put it up here on the board. I'm not a very good artist, but I'm going to do the best that I can. We talk about this idea of repenting and believing. In Mark chapter 1, after Jesus is tempted, we read that he then, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. That word time is called kairos, which is different than chronos as we look at time in history. Chronos is... I began, I'm living, life goes on, day after day, moment after moment. But when Jesus says, the time has come, the kingdom of God is at hand, what he's talking about is kairos, and what those are are kingdom moments. These moments, these breakthroughs where the kingdom of God breaks into our lives, and we have a chance to hear what he has to say, to repent, to believe, and if we follow it out, what we find is that it changes the trajectory of our lives as we become more Christ-like, as we learn to love others and ourselves well, to lean into our gifting, and then God breaks into our lives in another way, and it keeps working as opposed to continuing on this path of just surviving 
instead of thriving. So to repent and believe, to repent means to change our minds, to literally change the way we are thinking. Romans 12, may we be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And then it's out of that that then we respond to the world because to believe, to repent and believe, to believe, pistis, means to act as if it is so. But here's the problem, and here's why transformation is so key, is because we have these big kingdom moments, and they don't even need to be big in our definition of big. It could be as simple as I ran into a guy I know in the grocery store, and he said something to me, and it sent me spiraling. We have these moments where God, where the kingdom is breaking into our lives, and we are wired as humans in our backwards around the triangle-ness to immediately see, okay, this moment happened. This person I love passed away. I'm walking this horrible thing in my life, so I'm just going to do. I'm just going to, I'm just going to respond. I'm just going to, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. And we get stuck in what we have lovingly called in our discipleship groups the do-do cycle where we get stuck trying to figure out what to do because this thing has happened and I don't know what to do. Instead of stopping and saying, hold on, what is the first thing we have to hear? The voice of the Father. We have to hear what he has to say. We have to walk that journey because if we don't, we're going to be doing a whole lot of doing and not really get anywhere. We might be doing a whole lot of the wrong type of doing. We will miss the fact that before we do anything, God first cares about what's going on inside of us. When that person that we love who has passed away has just rocked us, when that loved one that we thought we'd be married to forever has left us, and our response is to do, and God is saying, hold on, let me remind you who I am. Let me remind you who you are. Let me rem remind you what we're doing here. That hearing the voice of the Father is at the heart of transformation. Recalibrating, repenting, hearing, and then responding out of that place. And we get to do that as God's people together. That we get to walk with each other I cannot, as I rack my brain through scripture, I cannot find very many places at all where we see Jesus interacting with just one person. In fact, as far as I know, I can only think of two. I can think of the interaction with Nicodemus, and I can think of the interaction of the woman at the well, and those are very strategic. Those are one right after the other in the book of John for a reason, because they have something to say to us, but that's it. Everywhere else in scripture, we see Jesus live intentionally with community. We see Jesus walking out the hearing and doing with the 12, with incredible friends who he decided, I'm going to do this life with. We see him reach out to the lowly and the lost and the broken. We see him reach out to those from other cultures. We see him interact with the world in community. Jeff sent me this article couple weeks ago. An article was from the Gospel Coalition, and the title of the article is How COVID Has Affected Friendships. And it has talked about this idea that that, that part in the middle, the, the fellowship and community in the middle, we have our intimate family. We have the people that we're blood related to, and we have those we interact with kind of out in the world as we mingle, as we go to the store, as we go to work. But that middle tier the friendship tier, the people that we would rub shoulders with, has all but gone away. In fact, the article goes on to say that we have replaced what was 300 hours of community, friendships, and church with screens, the internet, and social media. 300 hours on average per person. Now, those things in and of themselves are not bad. Don't leave today thinking Beth says social media is bad. However, 
there was already something in our world that was threatening to break pre-COVID. We were already a culture that prided itself in our individuality and our ability to do things by ourselves and our ability to keep people at arm's length and build walls. We were already there and COVID has just thrown us over the edge. And what we see is that Jesus invites us into community. Jesus lived life with 12 people. Jesus intentionally went out into homes, into towns, and he invites us to do the same thing. I love this quote. Jesus modeled, this comes from that article. Jesus modeled absolute devotion to his closest friends, intentional pursuit of disliked community members. Think of Zacchaeus. Conversations with those from other cultures, the Samaritan woman, eating with friends, family members, outsiders, attending weddings, funerals, cultural events, relationships with the poor and needy. He modeled all of that for us. Now, has there been a season in our world where we've had to be careful? Absolutely. But I think, I think it was there before COVID ever hit. This sense of withdrawal and the fear to engage in community. Because if you're like me, maybe you're afraid you might come across as ridiculous. Maybe if I lean in, they're not going to want it and then I'm going to feel foolish. Maybe if I lean in, they're going to see the cracks in my facade and find out that I'm not perfect. And guess what? Transformation comes when imperfect people are willing to come together to show their cracks and to move forward in the power and authority of Jesus. And so we are in the next season. We have as a church really begun to develop what we have, what really has been a powerful community here, and we're ready to take those next steps. We're ready to say, for those who are ready, are you ready for the next click in community? Our missional community Sundays are going to begin to look a little different. We're going to begin to intentionally take the next step for people to hear one another's stories and their life. It's going to be messy. It's going to be clunky. It's going to be awkward. Always is. The New Testament is filled with churches trying to figure out how to interact together. But it's worth it because we're worth it, and the heart of transformation comes in community. It comes in recognizing we're broken and recalibrating and repenting and learning to change our minds and to not get stuck in that do-do cycle, the do-do cycle of I'm going to continue to do this thing because then I can protect myself. I can continue to do this thing because then I won't feel the pain and the hurt. Transformation comes, and then acting as if it is so, that it is possible for someone to see me with my walls down and still love me for who I am, for someone to know part of my story and not cast me out, to live as Jesus has lived. And so... We are going to, as we talked about when service started, go into a time of singing. There are lots of different ways to worship our Creator and our King. But I had a strong sense this morning that this may be a Kairos morning for someone. That someone has been needing and waiting for the Kingdom of God to break into their lives. Have been waiting for that chance to meet with Jesus. Have been waiting to just be honest with where they're at. So we're going to go into three very familiar songs, but I'm going to ask something very different of us as we sing this morning. The first thing is this, when I invite us to stand, and I will do that in just a moment, I'm going to invite us to stand, and we are going to do what we often do in our young adult nights, which is we are going to fill this room with singing. So I encourage you that when you stand, we're going to spread out. We're going to spread out across this room. Give yourself space between you and the people next to you. And I'm actually going to dim the lights more than we normally dim them during worship. And so there's no fear of people watching you and seeing you. But I'm going to ask you to spread out and fill this room. Maybe you even want to come up over here or over here and just want to have a space to worship God freely. 
The other thing that we're going to do that we don't often do in worship is that sense of transformation that comes in hearing God and repenting and believing that comes through walking this out with community. If we're going to say that, we need to model it. And there, Rick and Stephanie are in the back over here. And all throughout worship, any time that you need, if you want someone to pray for you, to sit with you, Go back there. They are ready. They have been asking me, how can we pray for people? They would love the opportunity to pray for you. You don't even have to say anything. You can just go up to them and just say, hi, my name is Beth and I need some prayer. And they will pray over you. They will pray with you. And we are going to spend some time in prayer and worship this morning, authentically posturing ourselves to receive what the Lord has for us. Does that sound good this morning? Okay, I'm going to dim the lights. Will you stand with me? Will you spread out? This is a chance for us to just be real and authentic.